Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Chester Bellock Hour. Brought to you by your affable hosts, Caleb and Connor. Sit back, relax, and join us for an enchanting journey through the wit and wisdom of Chesterton and Bellock. Stay tuned. Hey, Connor, how you doing? I am fantastic. I uh, woke up this morning, went and volunteered with the Knights of Columbus. Nice. And then I just got back from confession, and now I'm furious with our mutual friend Colby because I'm here rooting for Mississippi State and Florida's kicking their teeth in. <laughs> How about you? How are you doing? Uh, it's 930 over here. I just got back from the gym. That's about it. That's all I've done today. That's, honestly, I'm impressed that you've been at the gym by 930 on a Saturday. I will not be at the gym all day today. <laughs> I guess that's been the weirdest part about recording these is we hop on and you're like, I've done all these things today. I'm like, I woke up an hour ago. Well, it's, <laughs> it's tricky for me when we're like scheduling one. I'm like, all right, 1.30 works for me, but earlier is better. And you're like, well, 1.30 is 9.30, so like earlier is not better. <laughs> yes. If you get me before 8 and I haven't had my cigarettes, it's I'm not doing anything. I can't do it. But this is going to be fun. We got some great we got some great poems, some great, some great quotes, another essay, third episode. We're chugging along. Love the show. It's going great. I I agree. Here's the thing. I think the reason I love the show. So did you ever follow uh, Thursday or I get Josiah, whatever his real name, Thursday yeah. thing about the Boscoists on Twitter? Mm -hmm. This show is very much that vibe. Like the whole theme was St. John Bosco's quote, run, jump, shout, but do not sin. Like just go have fun and don't mm -hmm. sin. That's exactly what the vibe of this show is. Like we are yes. <laughs> just having fun and enjoying it. Oh yeah, it's uh, listen. Ninety percent of podcasts nowadays are just excuses for guys to talk to each other without having to feel gay. Dude, I it's honestly, I terrible, I say but... that all the time. I my other podcast I have my co TCU college football one. Mm -hmm. We've got like forty or so listeners, so like people listen somewhat. But at the end of the day, the reason we do it is for me and two of my fraternity brothers to get on the phone for an hour, talk about TCU football. And like, no matter what, every week we stay in touch. Like, it's just yes. getting to be on the phone with them. It's awesome. Exactly. Which is why I encourage all white men to have, listen, there's, there's a whole tree on Twitter today where it's like men don't have spaces anymore because every space was invaded by women. Podcasting is the last bastion of the white man. Okay. <laughs> well, and it's it's funny because there are like women's podcasts, but even they are like women's podcasts. Like it is not like it's not an integrated exactly. podcasting. It is like you can just have a space for you and your people. Yeah. Do for, like do to like true crime podcasts, or like you're just trying to get in a woman's spaces, dude. <laughs> like the guy, it's like a guy who joins the Tealian team. Like, come on, we don't know what you're trying to do here. I, I will never <laughs> forget. So. My fiance is one of seven kids. Mm -hmm. So a year ago, I was smoking at a cigar lounge and this woman came in and started talking about how the problem with civilization is that men want a thousand kids and want to raise their own baseball teams. And that's what's wrong with civilization. <laughs> so I texted my fiance's mom. I was like, Katie, you would eat this <laughs> woman alive. You would shred her. And she texted me back and said, first of all, why is she invading men's spaces? <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> oh, no, that right, is, well, we want to get started on our men's space yeah, and uh, read some that. poetry. Absolutely. Do you want to go first or me go first? Um, you go first because we've got the essay this week from you. So we'll do <laughs> Belloc's poem first, Chesterton as a break, and then we'll go back to the essay. Sounds good. On the gift of a, on the gift of a book to a child by Hilaire Belloc. Sired, do not throw this book about. Refrain from the unholy pleasure of cutting all the pictures out. Preserve it as your chiefest treasure. Sired, have you ever heard it said that when you that you that you are heir to all the ages? Why then your hands were never made to tear these beautiful sick, sick pages? Your little hands were made to take the better thing and leave the worst ones. They were also made to maybe use to sake the massive paws of elder persons. And when your prayers complete the day, darling, your tiny hands were also made, I think, to pray for those men who lost their fairy lands. That's this is my favorite poem I've ever read after you sent it to me. Like it immediately became my favorite. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. It's so good. Well, because of course, we're guys who have a podcast on Chesterton and Belloc. Obviously, mm -hmm. we like books. Like that's kind of a given. But like I used to be a kindergarten teacher. So I spent a lot of my day 
telling children not to throw this book about. And there is, I, I love the line. Where is it? Oh. Uh, your little hands were made to take the better things and leave the worst ones. Because I think a child should throw the worst book about. Like, <laughs> a kid's book that you're not going to preserve and isn't beautiful. It was just a fun thing they had. Like, children are made to break stuff. I When I worked with kindergarten, my coffee always had a lid on it because guaranteed I was doused in coffee, if not. And I wasn't even mad at the kids when I was. I was like, it's my fault. I went to a five-year-old with an open cup of coffee. What did I think would happen? So like when you give a five-year-old a beautiful book, there is that risk that they're natural. He says, refrain from this unholy. Like, like it is something you have to refrain from. It's this natural temptation to just, yeah. as a child, tear it shreds. And you're teaching them, no, this book is beautiful. There's so much in this book. It is where your fairyland is. And I know because you're still living in fairyland, you don't care and you want to throw the book about. But if you throw the book about, you will lose your fairy land. It's mm. incredible. I, I love I the love end it. here where it's your darling little tiny your, your darling, darling, your little tiny hands were also made, I think, to pray for men that lose their fairy lands. I love the I love the point that like the song is this kid, you know, an inheritor of the ages of you know of, of the West, gets to, you know, the holy act of taking all the good ones, gets it from the book. Um, but also is to pray for those who have lost their fairyland because that is a big thing today. Is you see people, you're like, oh, you have no imagination. You've never and you never entered fairyland. You know, you don't mentally well, wander. I this is going to be a dumb comparison, but I actually stand by it. I was watching the show How I Met Your Mother with my fiance last night. Great show. And in it, the character Robin is doing this whole bit about how miracles aren't real, and she's like staunch on it. And like you, you look at it and it's like, here's the thing. It's a fictional character who, who doesn't exist. But you think of the real people who are like that. And it's like, look, there are some people, there are still some noble atheists left like Turnbull who genuinely just can't believe, even if they want to. But there's also this weird type where you have a, to prove you're better and more enlightened than the people around you. Your proof of that is that you don't believe in fairyland. You don't live in fairyland. You don't have fairyland. Mm -hmm. And it's so like, even on a freaking sitcom, I was like, it's so sad to see a person who's like, life must be explainable. Fairyland is off. And of course, miracles and fairyland are obviously different categories, but it's that same like willingness to believe. And as a child, it should be fairyland. And as an adult, it should sometimes be fairyland. Yeah. And it's, it's so sad to see someone lacking that. It's the glorification of skepticism, which has been a disaster for everything since no. the court. It's so – well, I've been complaining about it a lot lately as we're in election season and college football mm -hmm. season at the same time. And there's this thing that, like, the modern liberal does where they think it's very cool to tell you they don't like sports and then to follow up at some point by saying, well, the debates are my Olympics – which first of all shows that they're right that they don't like sports because who picks the Olympics? Like the debates are my Super Bowl. Or like there are so many better options. But they're like, oh, well, the debates are my Olympics. It's like, first of all, no one enjoys the debates. No one at all. The Daily Wire guys who are the world's biggest nerds will literally do their backstage and sit around smoking a cigar being like, man, I hate that we have to watch this. <laughs> it's there's And it's this thing where you feel that like, okay, well, it's childish to enjoy a sporting event. That's simulating war and I'm not violent. That's a, that's a stupid childish thing. And it's, it's adult to like politics. And they do this thing where they throw away the best parts of this stuff. They're like, oh no, you can't enjoy yourself. Enjoying yourself would be fairyland. And it's, it's cringe. so disgusting. Yeah. And it's like, just, here's the thing. I know plenty of people who don't care about college football. You don't care about college football. I'm not saying you have to like sports as a man. You should because you're a man. But if you don't, like that's hockey. fine. It's this weird thing where you like take pride in the fact that you don't find joy in the thing most men find joy. And I'm like, you're just, you're like trying to signal like, no, I am a soft, liberal, borderline oh, gay. Man. What it is is they, they, they have to be different. The yes, idea that. Exactly. They have to be different because it's a, it's a, like everybody else, the boy, and the biggest sin is boy, and the greatest virtue is novelty. And then they, they, everyone's like that nowadays, which actually it's more novel to be boring, which is yes, ridiculous, but it's incredible, isn't it? 
The most exciting guy you might you, know, you probably know is the most boring person by these people's standards. The guy who just watches the game, goes to work, and golfs on the weekend is a way more fun person to be around than these uh, and these people who are just bars of inward self self loathing. Yeah, when you're out here, the other thing being boring is more fun. Let yourself have your fairyland. If you let yourself have fairyland, real life, even if it's boring, is awesome. Like exactly, I'm. I'm getting married in my 20s with my fiance, and we most of our weekends are spent with her cooking while I read, like right now, the Cimmerillion. Like it's it's fun what enough. It's a boring, we're doing nothing. But like my fiance also got like Tolkien inspired wedding invitations for us <laughs> because we're not afraid to have our little fairyland. And because of that, when we're sitting around bored, we're not bored because we actually let ourselves enjoy life. Yes. And that's, why, a, that's why that last line is so impactful because it's like you do you do need to pray for the people and everyone listening should pray for the people who have lost their fairy lands. But there's something uniquely impactful about a child with their little tiny hands who that child is still in fairyland. I mean, honestly, that child struggles to tell the difference between fairyland and prayer and God. And like that's going to be a difficulty in the next few years of that child's life. But in that moment, that child is in fair, fairyland and, you know, Jesus calls like, let the children come to me. Like their prayers are so much more efficacious. And this is the one thing that they genuinely know more about than we do. They've spent much, much more time in fairyland on an average day than we do. So to have them just pray and say, yeah, we, we as children pray for these sad folks who have lost their fairylands. And you know what else? That includes you and I. Like, I don't just mean like the liberal who hates joy. I mean, like, even you and I, who, like, do our best to be whimsical, but we are not living in the fairyland we had 15 years ago. And we mm -hmm. need the children to pray for us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's let's go. Let's do, let's do wine, then we'll cut to the ad, and then we're going to move it to the next poem. What wine are you drinking we'll today, the, I thought we did the ad after the next poem. We do wines, poem, ad, essay. It might have been that. Yeah. All the same, we'll do wines. <laughs> I have... It was a gift from my dad, Santa Ana Homage Cabernet Sauvignon. So that's what I'm drinking. Nice. I don't have much left, but what I'm is that? Well, hold on. Go back to the wine stopper. <laughs> Mortel. It's my last name. Screw you. Yeah, is, for the listeners, that is, it's a giant M. There's a wine stopper for Mortel, and it's that's very, it's like a royal seal almost. That's very kingly. I would respect that. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome, <laughs> listeners. You're glad you got to hear that. I won't apologize for my awesome giant M. It is I bought awesome. it in Goodwill for a dollar and it's glorious. <laughs> so I'm drinking a uh, local wine, Bear Creek Blue Zin. It is 40% Alaska blueberry and 60% grape wine. It actually has blueberry pulp in the wine. I, I don't know how I feel about a blue wine. It's pretty good. But I feel incredibly strong about the fact that you're having a local wine. <laughs> like that's actually perfect for this podcast. Yeah. And that's the thing, like, that's one of the things, I don't know if Chesterton or Bellock wrote about it, I'm sure they did, but, like, beer and wine used to be the best way to experience a local culture, like, it, mm -hmm. before it was mass-produced, because that was something you really could do locally pretty mm -hmm. easily. Oh, yeah. I should, we should make a gro grape tree here. Rocky, I have to say, one thing I, I think people, we, we yeah. shit on it because it's very hippie liberal, nice. but if you go to, like, a good local um, brewery, You'll find local craft beers. It's great. Like in Lake, in, in my own, own, own old home in Florida, in Lakeland, there was a a brewery on a lake had outdoor outdoor bar, a, a live band, games, a food truck would park there, and you go inside, and there would be local ciders made from local breweries. I had a I had an apple strawberry cider made by a guy in like two towns over. It was incredible. Well, that's beer and wine. Alcohol in general is one of those things that really does where it's made makes an enormous difference. Mm -hmm. Where the plants are grown, where they're fermented it's i've learned this this year bread is the same way which Chesterton and belloc certainly wrote about at some point mm -hmm. um but bread is very and bread and cheese are very different from location to location and yes. we've mass produced them to the point that like different kinds of cheese almost taste the same and whole wheat and white bread taste the same but like when my fiance cooks genuine homemade bread for me she made me bread here and she made me bread in Colorado and it was her making the same bread both times and it tasted 
completely different in the two mm -hmm. locations. Like trying out a culture and a locality by food and beverage is so lost on the world. So even with me not liking the concept of the blue wine, I'm actively jealous because like that is oh, how you experience the culture. Look at the color of that wine though. Isn't it gorgeous? You know what? It's also not – for some reason I thought it'd be literally blue. <laughs> the fact that it's blueberries but still maintains that color. It's it's pretty great. The next time you're in Florida, you need to bring me some. I'll pay you back for it. Absolutely. I'm going to try to fix that word. It's across the border. <laughs> um. All right. Uh, from traveling, I know, speaking of food, local food, from when I was driving up here, going to Wisconsin and getting actual Wisconsin teas. Yes. Incredible. Uh, even, even though I got at a gas station, it was still good. And then also getting up to Alaska and realizing, hey, the chicken up here sucks ass because <laughs> there's no good chicken farms. There's nothing up here for chickens. McDon even the McDonald's nuggets are terrible up here. You know, and just the little things like that are very important. It's just different. It's whenever I take somebody to Fort Worth, which is where I went to college, mm -hmm. one of the main things, the first main thing I take them to is some sort of TCU sporting event. The <laughs> second thing is Billy Bob, the largest honky tonk in the world. But the third thing is just a bunch of restaurants like Texas barbecue is part of the culture. And that's mm -hmm. why Texans still have pride is that they haven't lost that piece of their culture. Hmm. Well, not, whenever you move somewhere new and people come and visit, they want to say, what's the cool local restaurant? That's just, they may not recognize it, but like, when you go to a new area, you want to try the local cuisine. You want to try the local food. They may yeah. not get it, but it's like, it may be all the same, but like you're in a new area, your brain just kind of goes, a new area, I need to try the new food here. Like the, the, yeah. food, the seafood up here, dog, like they don't have barbecue. There's no barbecue. I've yet to find any barbecue up here. It's tragic. But the seafood, <laughs> the salmon, oh, it's so good. Well, salmon was what I was thinking. I was like, they must have good salmon. They do. It's it's oh, and the beef is great too. It's it's got its yeah. upsides. Well, I actually I have to say, I'm shocked you're disappointed by the barbecue. Not I'm not shocked they don't have it. And I guess you were from more central Florida, so it was different. But the barbecue here in South Florida sucks. I've had I found one good barbecue place here, and it's just this black guy who has this sketchy truck on the side <laughs> of the road. Which, to be fair, is where the best barbecue is to be found. Yeah. But, like, if he's not out on the street, I don't go out for barbecue because there's mm. not good barbecue in South Florida. So I'm shocked yeah. that your bar was that high yeah. at all. Ne next time you come to Central – next time I'm in Florida and you're in Florida, we have to go to uh, Central Florida and Lakeland to a place called Missing Barbecue. Dog, the turkey there, it's so juicy. It's it's actually it's actually well, ruined every Thanksgiving because I not compare every Thanksgiving turkey to that turkey. It's so good. And that's actually a great test of a barbecue place because turkey is a hard thing to do right at a barbecue. Oh, yeah. I made one great turkey. I've never tried it again. I perfected it. Cooked it upside down, soaked in Dr. Pepper. It was perfect. Never again. I, 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 peaked, I peaked, never again. All right, well, on that note, speaking of pleasures, <laughs> I have a poem by Chesterton, and it is called The Song of a Strange Ascetic. It is... It was my favorite poem prior to this week when you showed me on the gift of a book to a child. <laughs> but it is certainly in contention for my favorite poem. Um, and it's all about, just as context, it is... Uh, it's about the narrator of the poem bemoaning the life of Higgins, who is his neighbor that is a heathen, and he doesn't understand his heathen lifestyle. <laughs> if I had been a heathen, I'd have praised the purple vine. My slaves should dig the vineyards, and I should drink the wine. But Higgins is a heathen, and his slaves grow lean and gray, that he may drink some tepid milk exactly twice a day. If I had been a heathen, I'd have crowned Nera's curls, and filled my life with love affairs, my house with dancing girls. But Higgins is a heathen, and to lecture rooms is forced, where his aunts, who are not married, demand to be divorced. <laughs> if I had been a heathen, I'd have sent my armies forth and dragged behind my chariots the chieftains of the north. But Higgins is a heathen, and he drives the dreary quill to lend the poor that funny cash that makes them poorer still. If I had been a heathen, I'd have piled my pyre on high and in a great red whirlwind gone roaring to the sky. But Higgins is a heathen and a richer man than I, and they put him in an oven just as if he were a pie. 
Now who that runs can read it, the riddle that I write, of why this poor old sinner should sin without delight. But I, I cannot read it, although I run and run, of them that do not have the faith and will not have the fun. That's, that is fantastic. I love it so much. Here's the thing. I love it so much because I relate to it so much. I've, I've mm-hmm. talked about this on some Thomas Review thing we did that like, I'm trying to decide about, we're 20 minutes in, I won't get us kicked off anything. If mm-hmm. I were a genuine heathen, like if I abandoned my faith, I would give up morals as a whole. And quite frankly, one of the first things I'd want to do would be to eat a human heart. <laughs> and okay. I'm bewildered by these people who have no moral sentiment of any kind, no moral mm-hmm. foundation. And like you see people who are like actively immoral and they're sitting here and they are the way they live their heathen life is exactly the line Chesterton described. It's the ants who are not married that demand to be divorced. It's a bunch of, as JD Vance calls, it, single cat ladies laying around <laughs> the room fighting for divorce rights that don't affect them. No, it, 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 I'm always torn when I see those types who are like the the heathen or the atheist who just lives a perfectly average normal life and doesn't you know give way to more. Than that. One, it confuses me because it's like, well, why bother? You know, if, if I'm going to reject God and reject right living and reject following His will, I'm going to do some wild shit. <laughs> let me yeah, well, do some like, drugs. Let me go to a party. Let me have some fun. But it speaks to the, the testament of Christian culture that even when they're not Christian, they're still Christian. <laughs> Well, and like you see the person who said sex a bunch of times and it's like, well, if I had sex one more time, that'd be too slutty. Like, why? Like, you already did all the other. Like, why? If it's not for some moral Christian, it, why? Name one. And the answer is exactly what you said. Like, the natural law is written on our hearts. We do know that it's wrong, even without practicing the faith. And it shows in the way heathens behave. Like, they know they're doing something wrong. And they overcorrect by remaining wrong, but also, honestly, it was we just had the best conversation. They choose to be different in a way that makes them more boring. Mm-hmm. Like that's exactly it, it's exactly what we just talked about. So I, I guess I also love the line here. Let me find it real quick. Um, uh, if I if I had been a heathen, I, I'd sit my army's force and drag behind my chair the chieftains and chieftains of the Norse. It reminds me of all the, the pagans on Twitter. I'm like, dog, you're a pagan worse than Zeus. Why aren't you conquering? Like, well, you, no, exactly. You're love toy. Why aren't you out there fighting, raping, pillaging, going to war? Instead, you're doing what? You're, you're cooking a steak, swimming on an altar, saying two prayers, and going back to, what, drinking your beer and doing nothing? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Well, it's like you're sitting there. You're like, you know, I'm not going to lie. The testosterone in me is telling me to go conquer. And to go, and I mean, I'm a scrawny, pathetic nothing. I couldn't conquer to save my life. But like a stronger man than I, you perhaps are sitting there like that. Men have that instinct Chesterton's describing to send your armies forth to drag behind the chariots, the chieftains of the north. So if you are a part of a faith that calls for that, supposedly, what are you doing? Why not? What's stopping you? Other than the fact that it's obviously wrong to go rape and pillage. What's stopping you? Because if you believe it's right to rape and pillage, why aren't you? It's the the moral contradictions between a pagan and his actions are always so odd. Like you, dog, you think they used to get they used to get the the gods used to get live human hearts, and you're putting a two day old steak on a plate. You think they're not pissed? <laughs> like the contradictions and, in paganism are so hilarious. <laughs> yeah, well, I wanted to ask you the exact question: Why is it wrong to get the live human heart? Why aren't you doing it? Is because is it because you're afraid of going to jail? Because like. That's fair. Cowardice is a threat. Like, I don't do things for my faith because I'm a coward. But if it's because you admit at all that it's wrong, then why is it wrong? And if you don't admit that it's wrong and you claim to be this brave warrior of the pagans on Twitter, go sacrifice a human heart. That'll be a great clip for Twitter. (laughs) Yes. I'm going to start doing that response to all pagan arguments. It's like, when's the last time you sacrificed a weird person? Fake pagan. (laughs) It's... What, what, what interesting times we live in today, Connor. Well, and it's funny because you even look at, like, you look at the, I, I know there are Protestants, there are a whole bunch of them, so I don't want to call them all at once. But, like, you think of the average Protestant that you get as a stereotype in your mind, and they behave a lot like Higgins. 
but at least they have a reason for behaving like Higgins. They're like, no, mm -hmm. their, their error is that they're overestimating what's wrong. And that's still an error, but it's an error that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas this the error, of, like I'm an the atheist and like nothing that. is wrong, but at the mm -hmm. same time, honestly, you got in an argument about this the other day. It's sin is a useless concept, but also <laughs> for some reason, actions are justified or unjustified. But unjustified is that's that comes from something. God, no, you that's a logical jump. But justified and unjustified, that's not rationalizing anything. I mean, Why I was I was amazed by that argument. I was, it was so I was so direct and simple. Just there was order. God made order, therefore, what's against that order is sin. Very simple concept. Is so we're not like we're asking, we're asking I'm like, why? Why is that irrational? It's well, it's also insane to claim it is useless. You could claim yes. it's wrong. It's not, but you could make that claim. It is very useful. In fact, if yeah. I were an atheist, I would understand sin to be a social construct that exists because it's useful. Mm -hmm. Like not something that surpassed uselessness. Yeah. It's it, they would if I was the, in an opposition, I would just reinterpret sin as like the Hawaiian version of taboo. You know, it's like, oh, it's it's taboo, therefore it's wrong for the community. Simple. So yeah, they, so the, the vitriol against the claim, vitriol claim of it's being useless, useless is just made out of anger. Yeah. Um. Before we go into the ad break, I wanted to say one thing on Sesterton and Belloc. This is the biggest. This is a tragedy of mine. They are both known for being really, really good debaters. We have no accounts. There's no. I can't find one recording. I can't find one written down exchange. Uh, I mean, there's a huge radio debate between Sesterton and George, George Bernard Saw that Belloc uh, moderated. On yeah. BBC, I can't find it anywhere. I've looked and looked. Yeah. They have a there's a Chester Belloc debating society, and we have no actual accounts of their debating moves. The, the closest Tragedy. thing, the closest thing we have to their debates is like when Chester Tim would just write somewhere in a book. My close personal friend George Bernard Shaw, who I will have cigars with this afternoon, and is my best friend, <laughs> is genuinely evil, retarded, and should kill himself. <laughs> That's that's true. When he like writes that. that every six paragraphs in everything he writes, he's like, "Here are all these points," and my best friend thinks they're wrong, and he's my best friend, and I would kill him if I had the choice. <laughs> Man, their their pub conversations had to have been so fun. Could you imagine sitting around with George Bernard Shaw, H. G. Wells, Belloc, and Chesterton? Oh, that would have been the best. <laughs> We have to sing George Bernard Saw, despite being wrong. He's the reason we have the title of Chester Belloc, which is a great, that is a great title. Yes, that's right. It's his slur. The eight-legged pantomime <coughs> elephant. Incredible. That's but let's go, into the, let's go into the ad break and we'll come back for quotes and essays. Awesome. And now as we pause from the stirring verse, let us turn our ears to the wise and uplifting words of the venerable Fulton J. Sheen. Stay with us, friends. There's more to come after this important message. But what is love? Love is not in the emotions. Love is not in the feeling. feelings. Love is in the will. And because it is in the will, love is subject to command. To command. You can never be commanded, for example, to, to like pickles. But you can be under a command, as a boy is under a command, for example. Now, please go up and kiss your Aunt Sophie. Now, he doesn't want to kiss his Aunt Sophie, but he's under a command, and maybe, maybe he does it. So love is subject, therefore, to the will. It can be ordered, whereas liking cannot. And we're only told, therefore, to love the neighbor. And how does this love work itself out practically? Because you may not be liking all the time. It is by doing a good deed. Do good to them who hate you. And as we begin to do what we ought and what is commanded, we may eventually begin to love that which we ought. And that is how we gradually come to love God and to love the neighbor sometimes that is not worth loving. All right. So now we've got your essay from Belloc, correct? Yep. Let's do this. This is um, 
one of his more funny essays. See what Belloc wrote a crap ton of essays. It, like, there's two different versions of his completed works, and there's a third one just for his essays. And that one doesn't even have all his essays. That's fantastic. So this is going to be one of his more comical essays that he wrote. On them. I do not like them. It is no good asking me why, though I have plenty of reasons. I do not like them. There would be no particular point in saying I do not like them if it was not that so many people doted on them. And when one hears them praised, it goads one into expressing one's hatred and fear of them. I know very well that they can do they can do one harm. And that they have occult powers, and all the world has known that for a hundred thousand years, more or less. And every attempt has been made to populate mm, sorry. Uh, a P, uh, I don't know the exact word, but I'm going to say a P, to appease them. James I would, d- would drown their mistresses or burn her, but they would spare it. Men would, mum- men would mummify them in Egypt, Egypt and worship the mummies. Men would carve them into stones in Cyprus and Crete and Asia Maya. Or more remarkable still, artists, especially in the Western Empire, would leave them out altogether. So much was the influence dreaded. Well, I yield so far to the print to not print their name and only call them they. But I hate them, and I'm not afraid to say so. If you would take a little list of the chief crimes that have been com- that they can commit, you will find that they commit them all. They are cruel. It's even in this um, shred and expression, they are hatefully cruel. I saw one of them catch a mouse the other day. The cat is now out of the bag, and it was very much more of a sickening sight. I fancied an ordinary m- murder. You may imagine that they catch mice to eat them. It is not so. They catch mice to torture them. And what is worse, they would teach this to their children, that children who are naturally innocent and fat and full of goodness are deliberately and systematically corrupted by them. There is a diabolic nature in it. <laughs> Other beings, I include mankind, would be gluttonous, and gluttony spasmatically, or with a method or same facially, or in some, in some way or another that qualifies the vice. Not so. They, they are gluttonous upon and upon all occasions and in every place and forever. It was only the last vigil of eight, all fool's day. Myself fasting, I filled up the saucer seven times as milk and seven times it was emptied. And there went the most peevish, cruelest, vicious compliment and demand for an hate. <laughs> they would eat some part of the food and all that is in the house. Now even a sire, the most gluttonous one, would sink of all living creatures would, and, uh, and would not do it. It makes this election. They do not. They will drink beer. This is not a theory. I know it. I have seen it with my own eyes. They will eat special foods. They will even eat dry, b- dry bread. Here again, I have personal evidence of that fact. And they will eat a dog's biscuits, but never upon any occasion where anything has been poisoned. So utterly lacking they are. They are in simplicity and humility, and so abominably well f- fired with cunning by whatever demon first brought their race into existence. <laughs> <laughs> They also, alone of all creation, love hateful noises. Some, be it indeed, and I count men among them, cannot help their voice which they, which they have been endowed. But they know that it is offensive, and they are at pains to make it better. Others, such as the peacock or the elephant, also know that their cry is unpleasant. They therefore use it sparingly. Others, again, the drove of the, in- the nightingale, the swiss, know that their voices are very pleasant and entertain us. And with them all day and all night long, but they know that their voices are the most hideous of all sounds in the world. And knowing this, they perpetually insist upon thrusting their voices upon us. Saying, as it were, I am giving myself pain, and I am giving you more pain, and therefore I shall go on. They choose for the places where the pain shall be given, extract in elevated situations, very close to our ears. Is there any need for me to point out that in every city they will begin their wicked jaw? This is the time when the inhabitants must sleep. In London, you would not hear it until midnight. Then the country town begins in 10. In remote villages as early as 9. Their master also protects them. They have a charm of life. I have seen one thrown from a great height into a London street. And when it reached it, it walked quietly away with the dignity of the lost world to which it belonged. If one had time, one could watch them day by day and never see them do a single kind or good saying, or be moved by a single virtuous impulse. They have no gesture for the expression of admiration, love, reverence, or ecstasy. They have but one method of expressing their content, and they reserve that of all moments of physical replacing. The tail, which is all other animals, a signal for joy or for deference, or is meant for mere usefulness, or for a noble anger, is them, is with them agitated only to express sudden discomfort. 
all that they do is venomous and all that they think is evil. And when I take mine away, as I mean to do next week in a basket, I shall first read a book of statistics. What is the wickedest part of London? I shall leave them there, for I know no one, even among my neighbors, quite so vile as to deserve such a gift. <laughs> so, He's so great. <laughs> it's so good. I agree with every single word. Hey, well, I'm, my I'm a favorite one. <laughs> my favorite one was their master also protect, protects them because I I'm sitting next to again to quote JD Vance a childish cat lady I'm going <laughs> to fix that in the next year don't worry but today <laughs> she is a childless cat lady and this cat lady giggled her way through this entire <laughs> essay she was holding her mouth shut because she wanted to be respectful and not interrupt our recording but she has been smiling ear to ear since you began reading. She immediately knew what it was. And she loved it because he, he's right there. The cat's master does protect it. The cat's master is aware of all of this and sees it as selling points. Like she's giggling her way through me saying this. And then, oh my gosh, chef's kiss. <laughs> Where is it? I don't know which where it is because the one I'm reading is all where he says that they wait. Here it is. The fact that they wait. Uh, I can't find it specifically. But the fact that they wait for the village to go to sleep. <laughs> yes. In the, uh, spot on. Spot <laughs> on. This should be taught in biology classrooms because this is a perfect assessment of this feline demon creature. So I, I am of the... I. I recognize every single complaint he has made has been 100% true. Cats would do all those things. And that's what I love about cats is there is a, a vicious nobility to them because they, 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 like, they act like lions, tigers. All cats act the same, just a matter of size. And so when you see a cat to toying with a mouse or meowing, this still bug you. And the way they this they eat, always eat, it's like you have to constantly care for this king of a jungle that has decided, no, you're going to care for me now. It, the dog will be your best friend and it will protect you and love you. And it's great. A cat will walk basically. I've never known anyone who actually buys a cat. Everyone kind of just gets a stray. The stray will walk in. You kind of just go, yep, I have to. Rest this cat is demanded. I care for it now. I am the peasant. It is the king. I must care for this cat. There's a nobility, of, there's a nobility to the cat that is wonderful. So. Cat lady over here nodded at everything you said, like <laughs> full on agreement. So the other thing I like, and this is just because I'm reading Tolkien right now, so it's particularly on my mind. But I love that when he's referencing the animals with the beautiful voices, he picks the thrush. I don't think he read the, the Hobbit. I don't know if that was something he would have had an opportunity to read in his life. Like I don't think, I don't think so. That works out. So there's no actual connection there but in my mind i remember like i immediately go to the hobbit the hobbit woke up or the thrush woke up smog which was a problem in the first place but then reminded bilbo of elrond's message to like save the day and then finishes it as a sign of hope and the reason that tolkien picked the thrush as the sign of hope and that belloc picked the thrush as the beautiful voice is clearly the same reason that like they'd be out having a pipe or a cigar somewhere. They both lived roughly the same area mm -hmm. and they would hear the local thrushes presume mm -hmm. like that was their own sign of hope and beauty. And that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we know Tolkien read Belloc poems. So you might have read this one. Tolkien referenced Belloc's poems in um I want to say it was in one of the songs in Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. Uh, if Frodo's journey references specifically how he references them, but Tolkien references Belloc's poems and he references things that can't be demonstrated as obviously direct references, but as like you read it and he's clearly read Belloc in Chesterton. Tolkien was very, well, not just that, Tolkien's best friend was C.S. Lewis and C.S. Lewis said that orthodoxy is what converted him. So it's it's very easy to assume that Lewis and Tolkien would sit around and discuss Chesterton. Yep. I, I, I try to tell my Protestant friends, like, you love Lewis, right? Yeah. You love Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah. Okay. They wouldn't exist, exist without Chester Belloc. You yes. You should go read Chesterton and Belloc. 
everything C.S. Lewis says and is great can be found in Chester 10. Yes. Uh, and Belloc is just read. If, how could anyone read uh, Road to Home and not be like, oh, this guy's incredible? Path to Rome. <laughs> Path to Rome, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that is. Oh, it's so good. I, um, I was saying it to uh, Ava the other day that every. I originally said it that every parent should have to read Path to Rome. And then mm -hmm. we amended it to say every father should have to read Path to Rome <laughs> and then remind the wife about it. Because. <laughs> Belloc is a little more geared towards men. Yes. But um, the reason I said it is that Path to Rome is all about a death to your own ideals. Mm -hmm. And that is like, what do I know? I don't have kids. But like, that is that is what parents tell me parenting is all that. Like you're, you go into your first kid, like they're never going to do that. This is my number one rule. We're sticking to this, this, this. And you give up on all of it by the time they're 18. <laughs> the exact same. And Granted, life is a death to ideals in that regard, mm -hmm. but parenting is like the ultimate version of it. Yeah, and there's it's something a, there's something that I'm like every parent should read and be like, you should go into your journey with these lofty ideals. Mm -hmm. You also are going to give up on them, and that's okay. Yes, you are going to get on a wheeled thing eventually. <laughs> no, I, but what I love about this poem, but this essay is it's it's like the poem we uh, read, "Lime to a Dawn." When Chesterton was angry at anything, the brutality of it, going for the jugular. I mean, every single line here is just like, oh, he he was a Belloc was a world class hater. Which is also very funny. You read his other poems, you're like, this guy was a, clearly a lover, a fighter, world class hater. You read about he has a poem about the uh, the sun and the moon, his brother and sister, and it's clearly very Saint Francis coded. And like, yeah, this guy probably was out in nature alone in peace with like very much St. Francis. And the moment he got back in the town was like, motherfucking people. <laughs> and it's just, it's exactly how I pitch a bell And I'm like, that's, that's so good. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, and you know what else? I also like, I was listening to Joseph Pierce's episode on Pints with Aquinas. Hmm. And he talked about how Belloc used to talk about the fact that uh, he was a world-class hater in a way that Chesterton wasn't. Chesterton yeah. loved. Chesterton did not hate nearly the same way. <laughs> and he talked about how he recognized that as a fault in himself. And that's so great because you know what? We needed his writing, but he mm -hmm. al it also is a fault in himself. And it's it, he was very cool about it. Yes. Was it, you can't read his, his Christmas poem and not say, you probably had to go confess it, maybe. I mean, it's clearly a joke, but to have be that angry and white that you have to go, yeah, you probably had to confess something. Um, but it's why I love that. That's why I love Belloc's histories, is because it's so brutally to the point. Yes. Like, his, his book on the Crusades is so good. Oh, yeah. His, whenever you see when he reads anything related to Rome, he has an immediate, goes into like a paragraph diatribe or a footnote diatribe against Gibbon. He hated Gibbon. He's just like, and he, one of his most popular books when he was alive was just a systematic breakdown of everything H.G. Wells wrote. <laughs> like, he was just like, no, here's why this guy's wrong. <laughs> Incredible. But you got a quote to wrap us up with, Connor? Or do you have anything I else you want to say? Quote. In, in the theme of your essay you picked tonight, I have a quote from Chesterton where he said, a cat is nature personified. Like nature, it is so mysterious that one cannot quite repose even in its beauty. But like nature, again, it is so beautiful that one cannot one cannot believe that it is really cruel. Perhaps it isn't. And there again, it is like nature. Man, there's this, this, this a lot to be said about cats because they're so unique when it comes to, comes to pets. <laughs> Every they other really thing are. Kind of similar. A cat is its own thing. And black people who say they're cat people, you're like, it's always odd when someone says they're a cat guy or a cat girl. You're like, it is odd. But then you have to think about it. Yeah, I've been around cats. I get it. As a guy, I've had cats my entire life. It's actually moving up here has been the longest stretch I've had without a pet cat. <laughs> and I miss the cat. I'm walking around like, wow, there's no reminder of pure uh, nobility of nature around where I'm walking around my house right now. There's no cats. I um the cat stays at her place and not mine. And I love when I open my door and I have no reminder of the nobility <laughs> of nature. <laughs> very, very uh, what's it? Uh, what was it? Uh, Lou Rockwell pilled when he votes by the environment. <laughs> oh my gosh, I forgot about that. <laughs> every every few days, I remind, I remember that quote. Remember his his most boomer rant in against the left. It's so every once in a while, I just pick up the book. I'm like, I'm gonna reread it. It's so good. <laughs> against the left is great. 
It really is. It's man, if Lou, if we, uh, we can't go into like li- saving libertarianism with Belloc, we can't go into that. But localism would save libertarianism. It would save yeah, all the it. about it. <laughs> okay, well, we've gone for forty-five minutes. Uh, any final thoughts on anything we talked about before we wrap it up, Connor? Um, no. My final thoughts. I'll just say I, I say this every week. Everybody, tune in for my frogs tonight. We play SMU. <laughs> Hashtag CJK5H. This is a family show, so I won't explain what that means, but Google it. Uh, <laughs> and otherwise, I'm I'm good to go. Okay. Let's move into prayer. Do you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. In nomine Patri et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. God, our Father, you filled the life of your servant, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, with a sense of wonder and joy and gave him a faith which was the foundation of his ceaseless work, a charity towards all men, particularly his opponents, and a hope which sprang from his lifelong gratitude for the gift of human life. May his innocence and his laughter, his constancy in fighting for the Christian faith and a world losing belief, his lifelong devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and his love for all men, especially for the poor, bring cheerfulness to those in despair, conviction and warmth to lukewarm believers, and the knowledge of God to those without faith. We beg you to grant the favors we ask through his intercession, so that his holiness may be recognized by all and the church may proclaim him blessed. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, source of our holiness, you raise up what's in the church in every age, men and women who serve with heroic love and dedication. You have blessed your church through the life and ministry of your faithful servant, Archbishop of Portland's Acene. He has written and spoken well of your divine Son, Jesus Christ, and was a true instrument of his Holy Spirit in touching the hearts of countless people. If it be according to your will for the honor and glory of the most holy trinity and the salvation of souls, we ask you to move the church to proclaim him a saint. We ask this prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, and that's our show. Everyone, thanks for listening. Uh, tune in next week as we continue to talk more to Chester Belloc. Until then, yeah. have a good night. Our hour together has drawn to a close. We hope... The Chester Bellock Hour has left you with thoughts to ponder and a heart a little lighter. Thanks for listening. Until next time, we wish you a restful night and a bright tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>